I love what I do and I do what I love. And I remember being your age, being a little bit confused about who was I? What was I supposed to do? What was life all about? So I'm really addressing this bumpy ride and journey. And those of you who are sort of 16 to 18 at the moment, um, a, a number of years ago, some strange things started happening, didn't they, to your body? I don't know, need to go into details, do I? <laughs> yeah. Not only that, but some unusual things happened to your mum. She suddenly grew three heads and was really critical and she used to be really nice. And moods. Oh my God, moods. And then also something else happened. The way you saw yourself suddenly looked like not as good as it did before. It's like seeing the world through a cracked mirror. Welcome to puberty and welcome to adolescence. And I was a high school teacher for years and I loved, I loved the kids of that age and I loved the boys who were prone to farting in my classrooms, um, who, who often did really incredibly dumb things, not because they were bad, they just didn't think. And so there began a fascination with how do I support young people on this ride through until they become adults? Because for me, this journey was really bumpy. I had crushing low self-esteem, but you wouldn't have picked it. I was really good at sport. I was really clever. I was a school leader. I was in the drama. I had a boyfriend. I had friends. I had all the boxes ticked, but inside, I just felt like I was a worthless pile of poop. I hated who I was. And it took me a while to realise I wasn't alone. Now there's some things that our grown up world is doing to you that they say to you some things that I'm gonna tell you aren't technically completely correct. And one of the first ones, one of the first ones is, um, they tell you that you can be anything. Well you can't. Check out this physique, size 10 feet, hands bigger than most men, a butt, oh my God, huge, that lovingly landed when I was 14. I wasn't happy about it. I could not be a ballet dancer. So don't tell me I could be anything, because I couldn't. I also can't hold a tune. So I was never going to turn out to be a rock star, Kylie Minogue, not, hot shorts, not. I was never going to be in, you know, I think, can you see one sec? When people come and tell you you can be anything, that's technically a fib. The second thing they often tell you is, oh my God, the highest marks you get at the end of your final year of schooling, oh, that's the way to be successful and happy. It's a possible way. I've met lots of young people who wiped out at school. They've ended up becoming fabulously happy people. So it's technically not quite true. And the other thing that they tell you is that failure is to be avoided. Watch out for it. Oh my God, have you failed? And I'm going to tell you that failure can be an ally. So for me with crushing self-doubt, I thought, you know, the thing I've got going for me most of all is the fact that I'm smart. I can write great essays. Yeah. I actually had a mask on to cover my low self-esteem and I called it the academically superior bitch mask. <laughs> So I wasn't really unkind to people. I just say, oh, what did you get on the maths test? <laughs> oh, really? Is that all? <laughs> there is a lot of masks that adolescents put on, don't they? There's the smart Alec, isn't there? The clown, <laughs> they hear that, miss, yeah? There's the bully, get out of my seat. There's the sporting jock, he says, oh, please, miss, I don't need to learn how to write an essay. I'm just gonna play football for Australia. Let me out and get the footballs early, yeah? There's the show off. There's all sorts of masks we put on. And when I began to understand that they're there to hide you from the world because lots and lots of adolescents, when their brain does that pruning around 13 and 14, seriously have crushing self-doubt and low self-esteem that we cover. So I thought I was going to be smart the whole entire life. So it doesn't matter. That was how I thought, God, one day I'll go to university. I'll get a degree. That'll make me feel good. Well, unfortunately, in my second semester at University of WA, I failed my first essay of my entire life. It was a politics essay. No wonder I don't like politicians. And what happened was my mask 
that I hung my worth and value on cracked. I remember walking out from, it wasn't a bad fail, it was only 46. Heck, nowadays that's a pass when you look at some of the, <laughs> it is technically, it was much tougher in those days. And I remember walking with this numbness as I headed back to where I was boarding at St. Cat's. And I remember walking in, I can remember the thoughts in my head. Oh my God, that means there's nothing good about me. If I'm dumb, there's nothing good about me. And I don't want to live in a world where I'm just useless and worthless. And I, I without any planning, went into my room and I had a bottle of tablets for a bad back and I tried, I'd, I'd swallow the whole lot. I just wanted to die. Now, I was lucky that I didn't do a very good job of it. And when I vomited and I was rolling in a fetal position with snot and tears, and I had like a moment when I thought, oh God, how easy is it for you to take your life at this age? And I was so glad that I'd mucked it up. And in the days that followed, I looked at that and thought, you know, I don't want to do journalism. I want to go and work with young people who might feel a bit like me. So failure is not all bad. It's not all bad. The same as winning isn't all good. And I want you to remember those things, that sometimes well-meaning adults will say things to you that might make you think that it's just not going to be okay for me. So I became a high school teacher, and I'm very, very glad about that. Um, and then something else I found in my classrooms, that I found it actually wasn't what you put on a piece of paper that what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny things to what lies within us. I started to see my students through a different lens. I started to find the unique part of them that they were bringing into my classrooms. And I was lucky I was an English teacher so we could do lovely things like creative writing and having a voice and stretching things out. And I suddenly found so many of them all tried to be the same, to be safe, until I worked out that inside every single human being ever born is a spark of potential and possibility. And our job as educators isn't to help you pass tests. You're not a brain on a seat. You're a whole person with a spark and our job is to nurture that. And I was lucky I had teachers who could nurture that because I, once again, had some really good teachers. So what's the inner spark about? There are a lot of names it can be called. It can be called your inner warning system. It can be called your inner compass. It can be called your higher self. Yep, it can be called the God essence within you. But it's pulsing inside every single one of you. I remember a girl saying to me one day, Mrs. Dent, can I tell you, oh my God, you mentioned that thing. I didn't want to say it in front of the others. But I have a guardian angel inside me. Can I tell you where I found out about it? And I was fascinated, I love kids' stories. She said, you know, one day I was laying on my bed on the weekend on a farm and I was just reading, reading a book. This was before the internet, of course, reading a book. And I had this awful sort of uncomfortable feeling within me and I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna get up and, no, I, I'm, no, okay. I'm gonna go and get on my bike and I'm gonna go for a ride and see if I can make myself feel better. And as she went for a ride, she said, I, I noticed that there was a, the tractor was right down by a fence and I thought, well, that's really weird. The tractor's making a weird noise. I'm going to go down and see what's wrong. And when she went down there, she found her dad trapped under the tractor. She said, I was able to ride back home and get help and my dad was able to survive. She said, who told me to do that? It's inside us all the time trying to nudge us in the right direction. And inside every single one of you, it is there. And there were days like my, my suicide attempt was not a disaster, it was a wake-up call to get me in the right direction. And so that spark is what is in every one of you. And it's in every adult in the room, and we know when we're not doing good. It gets restless. It gets kind of, I need to do something else. So for some people, that spark means they have to go and climb mountains. It, it, that doesn't do it for my spark. <laughs> I couldn't think of anything worse. And I honour them because that's theirs. Yeah, I have four sons who love to surf. Do I wish they didn't? Yes, especially the one that lives in yelling up. But he looks at me and says, Mum, that's where I am at my happiest. And I say, you do it, babe. So you've got to find out what it is within your spark that gets you going. Because that's what we're here for. 
Some of you can do it academically. Some of you are going to do it in other ways. And I had one beautiful boy in one of my classrooms. Um, actually, I had a lot of beautiful boys, but I had a lot of beautiful boys who underachieved, who thought they were dumb and useless and stupid. And this particular boy taught me a really important message, that it's not just the bright kids, the ones that can run like the wind, sing like a bird, play a violin, that matter. That every single one of you matters. This little boy was illiterate and, and he was 13, so he couldn't read. He could write his name, but nothing else. And I used to think about it, and there were times, good, all good educators lay awake going, God, how can I help that student? <laughs> They're all nodding, I know, two o'clock in the morning, what else can I do? And I thought, we've failed this boy, we, we've actually failed him. And within my curriculum, I couldn't teach him how to read, it's too late. And I thought, he's never going to be able to get a job. He can't even fill in the Centrelink forms. How's he going to get a license? You have to... And I used to think, that, that, he's set up for failure. And it did worry me. Many years later, in the midst of my, um, in, I call it intensive breeding program, um, I had four boys in the back, of, three boys in the back of my car, and I pulled up to a service station uh, to fill up my car. And in those days, it's a very long time ago, they used to come out and fill up your car, but most of you young people have no idea what that is. It's called service. <laughs> and I was sitting... I was sitting in the front and this young boy that used to be in my year eight class, David came out to fill up my car and I went, oh my God. And he went, Mrs. Dent, oh my God, it's so good to see you. And as he's filling my car, he washed my front windscreen, the side mirrors, the back window of my car. I reckon if I'd had a bit more time, he would have washed my whole car. And he was chatting away and telling me about who he was and asking about the boys' names. And, and as I drove off, my heart was really full with a sense of, he's actually created a worthwhile job. And I'm driving away feeling better, so he was doing it with passion. And I felt so good, I thought I'd go back and get fuel from him again. And the second time I went back, I was parked by behind two other vehicles. And David was racing out doing their windscreens and their side mirrors. In other words, he gave special treatment to everyone. And that's when I got a lump in my chest and thought, my God, this young man is making our world a better place by doing it with great joy and great love. And then the third time that I went there, because obviously I needed all the help I could get, you know, sleepless nights, you know, pooey nappies, you name it, I had the bucket load happening. And I remember pulling up and it was behind, um, and we were waiting, there were two of us waiting, and then these two elderly people walked across through the service station on the way to the shops. And David ran out with a cloth and he wiped over the edges of their walkers and chatted to them and I could see their faces and so many elderly people feel so separated and lonely. I had tears rolling down my face and realised he was doing work of the highest order and he was illiterate, but he was using his spark. And that is our job, that in there, we've got to find out what ours is. And that, that's all we have to do, is kind of make the world a tiny little bit better that we've lived. And the very first day, my crushing self-esteem stayed with me for those first few years of my teaching. But there was one day when I felt something odd was going on with one of my students. And I asked them to have a chat with me. And we sat down on the back steps of the high school I was teaching at. And when she told me her story and showed me her scars and said that really, she didn't want to be here. She'd had three suicide attempts. I spent an hour with her I was untrained at that point as a counsellor. I listened. That girl came to me at the end of the year and told me she'd never ever thought of killing herself again. That was the moment my self-esteem, my low self-esteem disappeared. I was now worthy of living. It didn't matter that I get awards and do all sorts of amazing things. That's just nothing. A person's life had improved because of mine. And from then, it all got easy. So I'm going to challenge you that, what are the things we can do for young people? That there are so many of you already out there doing good things like volunteering. There are also others who do amazing bravery acts just on the spur of the moment. And one happened in Perth just recently with some students at a train station. 
working with children with disabilities and special needs, that's another area we do. Instead of going to schoolies and getting completely maggoted for a week, maybe I might go with my friends and do something significant as my rite of passage. There are so many possibilities for you. Maybe, just maybe, instead of winning, you might help someone else. Maybe that could be you one day. Maybe you're going to look after nature and be one of our fantastic environmental warriors. Or maybe you are going to be someone who teaches. What is it that pulses inside you? That's what you have to find. You may need to help others. Or you may simply need to create music or sing. It's inside you. You just literally, literally got to find what it is. Or maybe then, at the end of the day, the most fantastic thing you can do in your life is to be an amazing, loving husband or wife, mum or dad. What defines us is our actions. And that, that's what I want you to take home and remember, that the purpose of life is to matter and to count, to stand for something, to have it make some difference that we have lived at all. And it doesn't have to be huge. We don't have to win Olympic medals. We can do small things. And I'd like to leave you with a couple of other little tips. And one of them is that if you really want to be able to do something well, you have to practice. It just doesn't pop in your lap. And you've got to be persistent. I used to get up when I first started doing this, shaking with nerves. And that doesn't happen anymore. So persistence is important. You cannot do this journey on your own, even though I've just talked about you being authentic and individual. You actually need others. Hopefully loving parents, significant adults that I call lighthouses, and you certainly need your friends. And you can start being that person by stoking your own spark today. <laughs>